Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I want to welcome you firstly to our side event, the police side event at the CFRN Pavilion. And uh, the title this afternoon is The Valley of Belize's Forest and Its Journey in Red Plus. This is something that's very important for us. Uh, for those of us, for those of you who know about Belize, you know that we are a country with a high amount of forest, and we tend to use that not only for uh, addressing issues related to climate change, but for the development of our people. And so it's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. It's my pleasure to see all of you here. So welcome. I hope you enjoy the, the presentations that are going to be made. And please hold your questions and comments. We will have a section for that. And you have the opportunity to ask any questions that you may wish after the presentation today. Um, we want to go straight into the program this afternoon. And uh, I want to invite of the executive director of CFRN, the Coalition for Rainforest Nations, Mr. Kevin Conrad. Is he available? He's going to provide us with some brief remarks. And um, afterwards, uh, we will have some remarks by our minister. Okay, um, Mr. Conrad is not here at the moment. We will have those remarks. Oh, I see him coming. I see him coming. So, we'll have some brief remarks by Mr. Kevin Conrad, executive, executive director of CFR. Thank you, guys. I hope everyone can hear. My role here is just to congratulate Belize. It's been a long road. There have been transitions of governments, but they're one of the few countries that is actually ready to deliver results that are Paris compliant and post them on the Red Plus Information Hub under the Paris Agreement. This is a huge thing. It's not easy. The Paris Agreement is a very difficult and complex process to complete. The results are rigorous. They're reviewed. The reference levels are reviewed. This is, this is not an easy thing. Papua New Guinea has gone through it. Belize is now completing it. We're hoping for Panama. We're hoping for Gabon. The fact of the matter is simple. We cannot keep 1.5 alive without reversing global deforestation. In practice, we cannot keep 1.5 alive without countries like Belize. So, Minister, I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate the CEO and the technical team that have made this all possible. You guys are leaders, you're examples, and we're here to support you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Conrad. Uh, we'll go right into our program, but uh, before we do that, let me just introduce myself. I forgot to do that before. Uh, my name is Colin Mattis. I'm the Deputy Chief Climate Change Officer in the National Climate Change Office which is in the Ministry of uh, Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management. That's my minister and that's my chief executive officer there. And so you'll be hearing from them a little more today just to know that I work for them in their ministry. So uh, thank you everyone for that. And so we will go into some other remarks. Uh, minister Orlando Habit, he's the Minister of Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management. And at this moment, he's going to present uh, to you some brief remarks before we get into the presentation. Thank you, Colin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would first like to wish you all a pleasant good afternoon. And on behalf of the Ministry of uh, Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management, uh, wish you all uh, 
some, some, uh, <laughs> some time here that we will be able to share with you uh, what we have gone through uh, with, with our program. But uh, before I continue, I just want to recognize uh, some people here with us that uh, have done some of the work. Uh, our team, uh, starting with uh, our CEO, uh, Dr. Kendrick Williams, uh, members of our staff in the ministry, uh, uh, Ambassador Conrad, uh, we have um, uh, Mr. Reyes here with us. So thank you for coming. Belize, as a small country with relatively minor contributions to global greenhouse gas emissions, has limited capacity to contribute to mitigation of global climate change. Nevertheless, the country is committed to achieving the ultimate objective of the convention and supports the even more ambitious target to limit the increase in global average temperature to 1.5 degrees compared to pre-industrial levels. At the heart of this ambition are forests, one of the most important solutions to combating the negative effects of climate change. As a net carbon sink, Belize recognizes the importance of maintaining a healthy forest system and continues to employ sustainable management practices which have resulted in a forest cover of approximately 60% of its landscape. With its values rooted in continual improvements and increased ambition, Belize recognizes the importance of Red Plus activities to meet both its national and global climate change commitments. With the goal of Red Plus being the significant reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from forests, Belize has taken the necessary steps to reach Red Plus implementation, including the finalization of the readiness phase. During this phase, four elements of the Red Plus program are being developed. These include the preparation of a national Red Plus strategy or action plan, the creation of a national forest reference level, which Belize has already submitted to the UNFCCC, the development of a national forest monitoring system, and the creation of a safeguards information system. The Red Plus strategy aims to transform Belize's land using planning and management by strengthening coordination at the government level with platforms for cross-sector and public and private collaboration, reducing perverse incentives, creating new green incentives, and developing clear criteria for the evaluation of development plans. Generate innovative, substantial, and sustainable economic and non-economic incentives and benefits of forest resources and improve forest livelihoods. To improve economies and livelihoods of forest dependent communities by supporting and enhancing their sustainable land and forest stewardship. To conserve Belize's forests in order to sustain their ecosystem services, conserve biological diversity, provide benefits for forest dependent communities, and maintain a cultural heritage for generations to come. And to develop and maintain a system through continuous improvement that produces and shares forest information, allowing for better management, control, and reporting. To further formalize its commitment to climate change mitigation, Belize has included Red Plus in its recently updated National Determined Contribution, its NDC, which collectively is estimated to avoid a cumulative emissions total of 5,647 kilotons of carbon dioxide between 2021 and 2030 including a 63% increase in GHG removals related to the AFOLU sector. This updated NDC reflects Belize's commitment to enhancing its climate ambition. Notably, ambition has been integrated through the following enhancements. Improvements in data availability and analysis of projections underpinning the commitments, especially in the AFOLU sector. Realistic and achievable commitments Increased ambition through expanded sectoral targets, expanded coverage of gases covered in targets to include uh, nitrous oxide and methane in a follow interventions. Further specification of targets, including addition of time frames, quantified emissions reductions, and other outcomes. Increased transparency in the development of targets. Uh, the detail on financing, monitoring, and implementation of actions included in the NDC. Ladies and gentlemen, during this side event, you will hear from us about the process 
and outcomes of our work under Red Plus Readiness, and it is my hope that you will acquire considerable benefits from this side event and that we will be able to have fruitful engagements with you, the stakeholders, relating to the issues to be presented and considered. As such, I thank you all for being here and I would like to encourage you to share your ideas, experiences and knowledge so that we can continue to foster capacity in this important area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Habit. So we're talking about the value of Belize's forest and its journey through Red Plus. We will now have a presentation being uh, delivered to you, to us. I'd like to introduce the persons on the stage that are going to deliver this presentation. On my immediate right, we have Dr. Kenrick Williams. He's the Chief Executive Officer in the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management. On my immediate left, we have Mr. Edgar Correa. He leads the geospatial unit in the Forest Department in Belize, which is also under the, the ministry. And so we, we are glad to have him here. And on my far left, there's Mr. Summit Betancourt. He's one of the technicians that um, is currently working in the Red Plus Readiness Project. And so he has a, a lot of on-the-ground knowledge about what goes on, the procedures and processes and so forth for Red Plus Readiness. And so I'd like to turn it over to them as they present, as they deliver their presentation on the value of Blaze's Forest and its journey through Red Plus. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, next slide, please. So, as what Colin was saying and what the minister went through um, in his remarks, uh, Belize, if no one knows Belize is in Central America, it's a small country. And um, basically, in terms of its context, it's approximately you know 22,000 kilometers per mile. It's uh, dependent in terms of um, looking at main drivers in terms of deforestation, such as uh, agriculture expansion, um, infrastructure expansion. And basically, Belize, as other Caribbean countries, we, we do entail uh, activities from natural disasters such as hurricanes, and also looking at different impacts in terms of uh, fires and uh, also natural pests. So, in terms of Belize itself, I mean, we are implementing the fiber plus activities, and this was basically included within the forest reference level reports, and also part of its uh, greenhouse gas inventory. So when it comes to Belize, we are looking at the five activities, like I mentioned, in terms of reducing deforestation, uh, reduction in emissions of ground degradation, also conservation of forest uh, carbon stock, sustainable management of forests, and also um, enhancement of carbon stocks. And basically, like we said, this, this in terms of a plus for Belize at the national scale, we're looking at uh, forest uh, strategies to make it mitigate um, climate change. Next slide, please. So, in terms of looking at the national forest monitoring system uh, for Belize, uh, we are basically understanding and throughout the Red Plus project, and we actually started to look at different activities that uh, this includes. And um, basically, it, it entails two main activities. It looks at the development of uh, activity data and land use, and also in terms of the actual national inventory, or looking at permanent sample plots across the country which are two key, key main things that um, is included within our national forest monitoring system. Uh, and it actually moves into looking at the greenhouse gas invention that you'll we'll see a little ahead. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, it basically includes two main activities, um, which looks at the land use assessment. Um, this is basically done through remote sensing activities. And also in terms of the permanent sample plots, uh, collection of emission factors that is basically done within the field. And, and having these two things uh, combined, that's where we look at different outputs that we'll be explaining later in terms of uh, all this information that was collected for Belize that could now become relevant in terms of reporting. Next slide, please. So in terms of the collection of activity data, it looks at three main parts or process. It looks at the preparation, the implementation, and the validation. Uh, when, it, when it came to the actual 
in uh, preparation of the actual process, we had to have a lot of internal discussions before actually making any decisions. And this was done with key stakeholders within the country, uh, within the ministry, within the government, and also in terms of other private uh, stakeholders, such as NGOs and even the universities in the country. And also it has entailed in terms of what work was also done in Belize, in terms of its literature review, in terms of what existed, so as to not uh, reinvent the wheel in terms of what had already occurred. So again, we had to have some discussion in terms of what we, we were we were going for. One of the key things that we recognized uh, we had to adopt was to look at our definition in terms of forest. So as you can see, when it comes to Belize, we are looking at approximately, when it comes to the, the forest definition, we're looking at the area of 25 hectares um, with, with more or three less than, I mean, more than five meters or higher. But uh, it includes a, a percentage of the recovery of 30%. But it also includes uh, other area ecosystems um, that are mangroves um, that basically are not five meters but um, uh, are still included within the forest definition. So in terms of the collection of the, the land use assessment, we, we implemented a, a review of software from Open Forest um, that was developed through the FAO uh, called Collector Desktop. And this is basically where we basically did uh, the collection of baseline for activity data from 2000 to 2018 as the first step in terms of, of actually activity. And what that entailed was to actually, you know, have a, a systematic grid across the country uh, divided into uh, 21,991 plots in terms of uh, assessment that occurred. Basic and each of these plots basically represented uh, a 0.5 of a hectare and basically were uh, separated by one kilometer in distance. And through this grid now, we could have now mapped out the entire country um, to actually see what occurred um, basically one kilometer across and, and actually understand uh, history or year per year activity of land use change. And of course, we had to actually adopt some of the main uh, uh, six IPCC guidelines classes and from there we went on in terms of actually doing a subclasses and the specific classes in terms of national definitions. So um, that's basically in terms of the collection of activity data and which is a key part of the National Forest Monitoring System but I'll pass it over to my colleague um, Sir Betancourt to explain more in terms of the permanent sample plots. Uh, thank you Edgar and good afternoon everyone. So Edgar spoke to you a bit about the first aspect of our activity data collection, which is the land use cover classification for the country using the Collect Earth uh, monitoring tool. Uh, the second aspect now really focuses on land-based assessments. And in this case, we're speaking of the permanent sample plot network of Belize, which is a network that really encompasses both forest and non-forest vegetation uh, across the entire country and covering the three climatic zones, dry, moist, and wet. And essentially, what we the data that we need from this is really to estimate the carbon stock within these ecosystems and uh, uh, eventually the emission factors so that we are, were able to understand just how much carbon dioxide we're releasing when, uh, for instance, a one hectare plot of broadleaf forest is clear cut. Yeah, so like as, I, as I mentioned, it's really intended for long term standardized monitoring of, of both the forest and non forest ecosystems. Some of the parameters that we collect within these plots uh, include from each single tree, each one is enumerated, and we collect a height, diameter, breast height, crown health, liana load. So essentially, we're giving each tree a, a personality or a, it has a complete profile for each one, and we monitor this throughout time. So really under the Red Plus project, what we were able to do, and I, I, we, we believe is, a, is of, uh, uh, one of the great achievements under the project, is really expand our network. Uh, it initially started with 30 plots that, was, that were established uh, between the 1990s, and they were focused mainly on broadleaf. So uh, under the project, we were able to expand this to include other ecosystems, specifically under grasslands, we had uh, lowland savanna, ferns, thickets, and as well as croplands, which include both fallowland and pastures. So these are data sets that the country really never had before. 
And what this enabled us to do is really take our, our tier from, instead of using default values, we were then able to use national values, taking it from tier two and tier three. Here, these are just a couple of field images. Of course, we always take a, a team. I also have one of my team members here in the audience, Ms. Eda Almegra Halva. And it's usually a number between six to eight of us out uh, collecting these parameters at the same time. So it's really a team effort. And in terms of the capacity building, we're really, we're really able to, to expand on that. Uh, in addition, behind the scenes now in the office, we of course have a forest forest working group where we really develop these methodologies uh, with uh, using local expertise and of course guidance from the CFRN, Mr. Eduardo, uh, from Ms. Frederica, among others. And so here we were able to select, select the sites that we really needed to cover across the country, areas that, that had gaps, and again the development of the methodologies that were used. So in the end what we really needed was the greenhouse gas inventory, which is basically a profile of emissions and removals of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And we were able to do that combining again the, the land use cover classification from Collect Earth and utilizing the emission factors that we collected in country. And it gave us a, a very robust and accurate greenhouse gas inventory. So Edgar will again speak to you a bit about the results. All right, thank you, um, Summit. Yeah, so apart from the greenhouse gas inventory, and um, actually we also had some national statistics that came out of this, which was useful um, not only within the Red Plus project, but also within other um, national effort reporting and also other international commitments in terms of the country. So in terms of uh, looking at greenhouse gas inventory and uh, land use, we also looked at average in terms of losses, in terms of different um, uh, losses within protected areas, different landscapes, and which is useful for us. And like I mentioned, there were key, key outputs that, that have been um, gone going throughout the process. And one of the three um, things that we actually went through was to actually submit our forest reference level report, QNFCC, and which was actually gone through the assessment and basically accepted by the country. And also, this allowed us to also develop uh, a more realistic and updated NDC that, that looks at our ambitions and which is goes in line with all these, these key documents that we produced. Um, at the moment, we're actually moving on to the technical annex report under the line of, of the report, which will start the actual assessment um, as, as we get back home in, in, in December. So one of the main things that uh, we want to highlight is that uh, well, at the start, we, didn't, we weren't really sure what direction was gonna believe was going to go. And I think that one was one of the key um, things that we learned in terms of the capacity building and actually having a good understanding of, of what existed and what occurred over the last, year, last 18 years. And, and throughout this process, we, we could have like, uh, developed our first reference level and, of course, uh, the greenhouse gas inventory. And, and, and having these different um, two, two key things, then we could have identified that Belize does have results within uh, three years, and which is looking at the results for 16, 17, and 18. And, and, and when it comes to results, I mean, that these, are, these are key things that now Belize uh, moves into our next step in terms of now moving from just the assessment that was done and in terms of reporting, but now actually formalizing this uh, in terms of a national agenda and actually moving now to the next level of, of, of in terms of market, in terms of carbon, in terms of um, legislation, in terms of frameworks that the country needs uh, to put in place. So in terms of this now, this is a decision from now the technical level and now moving on to the um, decision makers level and now this is where the, the CEO um, will be actually expanding on how we'll be moving um, from here on. Thanks very much, uh, team. Let me, let me move my... Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I think what the, the team highlighted when, when the minister started some of this is is that, <coughs> as like many other countries, we were we were doing several of these ad hoc assessment of our deforestation or deforestation rates, right? So either a scientist will parachute in and try to estimate um, the rate of your deforestation and try to get some sense 
to, to, to influence policy. I think what this board did um, over the last couple of years with the support of CFRM was to apply a consistent methodology uh, to get, I, I, I think, song data guided by the IPPC guidelines, um, the classes, to really define consistently what we determine as, uh, as force and really to define the, the composition of force for us. Um, and with that, we now have, have some key results um, that I think, as, as Edgar highlighted earlier, helps to drive uh, not just where we go forward in terms of uh, markets and, and stuff like that, but it drives some important policy decisions in terms of force management. Um, when we look at, for example, um, the impact on, on forests in protected areas versus those outside of protected areas, when we look at those within communities, um, when we look at um, the transition of our country um, and, and how that is reflected within our forest, I think those are some critical um, results that we have that can help us to drive uh, a move forward in terms of uh, broader forest management. But uh, to the remarks that I was tasked to, to give this afternoon, it is really some of the discussion, and quite honestly, I'm not, I don't even know what's on the, on the slide. So let me look. Um, so the, the idea here is that as a country, we've seen results. So what do we do with those results, and how do we how do we move forward? Because um, as our, our many of the discussions that are happening over the last two weeks, it is that you know we are suffering from the impacts of climate change. But we have been one of those countries, as our forested nations, who've done our part in the mitigation side. Um, I think, and, and I think the thrust is that we need to realize financial benefits, not just to continue to support the conservation activities, activities and ensure that we maintain the forest carbon stock for the benefit of, of, of the globe, um, but that this has to contribute to addressing issues of social protection, addressing issues of poverty alleviation, because at the end of the day, we've done our part as, as a country, no? Um, so with the support of uh, CFRN, we're moving towards um, getting these results posted and again, seeing how we can now uh, go to markets. Um, and the next step is working with CFRN, um, one, to look at getting our results on the, the, the Red Plus um, hub. Um, and of course, the discussion then is, is going to markets and, and what does that entail? Entail, sorry. We're having some discussion, for example, on the, the legislative framework, the benefit sharing uh, mechanism through which we're going to apply. How do we ensure that there is a nested approach and there's a comprehensive uh, approach to, to moving towards market, ensuring that um, the communities, companies, private sector, public sector, all benefit from the investment that we have made in the past, but that it provides the incentive to continue to do this because this is report, remains an important policy decision and policy process for the government of Belize. And I think anything that we do has to be founded in, in, in that approach going forward. And so, again, some of the discussions we've been having with the support of CFRN and others, it is you know looking at this broader framework that, that can help to do that. Uh, how do we go to market? How do we ensure that there's a transparent process? How do we make sure that there's a recognized process under the UNFCCC? And I think uh, this, this process really allows us allows for us to do that. No? Uh, so in, in going forward, these are some of the decisions we're, we've been looking at in terms of the, the, the registry, you know, building the capacity within the Ministry of Finance, the Forest Department. How do we uh, build up the uh, and transition from the, the Red Plus project to um, mainstreaming this technical capacity within our government so that they can continue to support the forest monitoring uh, and the, those within the Ministry of Finance can support the market development, can support the engagement with the private sector um, so that we get the best bang for buck uh, because that's also one of the issues um, that, you know, um, we don't always get the, the, the best bang for buck. You have a lot of land speculation, you have, you know, international interest coming in and seeking um, to, to take advantage of this new asset. Um, and so those are some of the key considerations that we have to take in into consideration going forward as a government that would guide our, our policy decision going forward. Uh, so, um, I think, mm, yeah, I think we discussed some of it. No, of course, um, uh, just to, to grab a few things from the slide, 
um, in, in terms of the approach that we've used. Again, because we applied a standardized methodolo methodology, and these are the technocrats here, um, we see opportunities for exploring uh, and applying that methodology in other sectors, and we've been uh, working with uh, people within the energy sector, for example, to explore what opportunities exist in, in other sectors and see how we could explore emission reductions in those sectors. Um, of course, there, there are huge opportunities within blue carbon um, and, and blue economy space, and so there, there's opportunities to explore that. Um, our government recently established a ministry of blue economy, um, and we're looking at how we're building out the blue space and more integrated approach to uh, marine conservation, and so going forward, this will be very critical um, in, in the discussion uh, going forward. So thank you, I think we have a short video. Okay. So I believe that you've been seeing this video uh, when the presentation started, so you, know, you can just enjoy it a little more. Uh, it's time for your questions. Uh, you've heard a lot about the Red Plus Readiness process, how it was implemented in Belize, and I'm sure that there may be a question or two, or you know, you can give comments if you wish. So uh, just raise your hands and I can bring them back to you. Yes, and um, just introduce yourself so that we know who you are for everyone else. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Chris Gentle. I'm from the World uh, Energy Council. Uh, my question was just at the end there. You were starting to talk about how you could uh, develop a blue carbon economy. Uh, is it possible you could tell us any more about the detail about how you might maybe be able to make that happen, and what's the time frame? that you anticipate that a blue uh, carbon economy might start to take hold in Belize? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. Uh, we're really just at the nascent stage of, of, of this process. We recently established the Ministry of the Blue Economy. Uh, within or for its reference level assessment, we included, for example, mangroves. Uh, we know there are opportunities, for example, in seagrass and, and other areas. So. Um, the, the Ministry of the Blue Economy will be exploring um, um, those key areas now. Um, because it's a, uh, in this nascent stage, we've just recently looked at you know, the strategic direction. Um, we've, used, we've looked at the, the broader uh, strategic approach for, for marine conservation in Belize. Um, you may know that the government of Belize recently engaged in a, a debt to climate swap, if you will, um, through collaboration with the TNC. And, and so, we're exploring further some of those opportunities through strategic planning. And uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, even in our NDC, uh, uh, blue carbon is featured very strongly. In terms of we have over 12,000 hectares that are being protected right now. We're increasing that to 12, uh, up to 2030 by another 12,000 hectares. And we, in terms of degraded areas, we're replanting in those areas. And so it's featured very, very strongly. And so our ministry is working hand in hand with the Ministry of Blue Economy to ensure that that happens in the next 10 years. And we are uh, very much committed to that. Um, more questions? Thank you. I'm Peter Boyd. I teach at Yale, but also help the coalition with Red Dell Plus. I'm very excited to see your progress here. It's, it's, it's really exciting. I'm thinking if we want to take this to the wider world, which are the kind of companies and cities and sort of northern partners that you would love to have? Um, who, who do you already feel like, like could uh, but to buy into this fantastic story?
I think everybody who has good money and understands the importance of what we're doing would be good. Would be a good start. Um, but I think that's the the support and discussion we've been having with CFRN um, in, in terms of how to ensure that this is strategic and it's not a free for all market, and you know um, we're just being reactive to, to whoever offers. Um, we, we think that beyond the results that we have, what we offer is a unique brand of um, credits, if you will, um, because of the fact that you know the, the, the we have areas that are you know, unique, the only Jaguar reserve in the world. You know, we have these unique areas that we've protected over time, uh, sensitive community areas that have been part of the, the conservation for, for a long time. So I think we want to be to align with, with uh, private interest who supports that and who will continue to support, support that going forward. No? Um, so I think that the, the partnership with CFRN, who, who I believe has been, been looking at, I think, some of those key issues and that, so those are some of the discussions we've been having on the ground in Belize to look at socially responsible country, uh, companies, uh, to look at environmentally responsible companies that would help us to achieve those uh, similar goals that, that, that is really aligned between these two partners. Right? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Emilio Sencris, a former Minister of Environment in Panama. Um, as you probably are aware, uh, our country was also supported by the uh, coalition a um, few years back after, uh, right, uh, right after Paris. And um, I've been following this process very closely, um, bragging about the work that we put together with the support of the coalition. Our, our country put together probably one of the uh, best forest reference uh, level out there and we, we were really proud and actually in Central America wherever I, I, I went I would argue that our, our forest reference levels was the best in the in the whole Latin American region but after seeing this presentation I think that the, the, the title now goes to, to Belize for the work that you, you guys have, do, you have done so I, I would like to give a round of applause for, for you and now uh, the challenge is up. Now Belize is number one by far in Latin America. I, I could not argue about Africa or Asia, but I, at least in Latin America, Belize is number one in terms of forest reference level and transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to think that Eduardo had something to do with it in both countries. <laughs> because I know he worked in Panama, then he worked in Belize. So. Uh, yes. Hi, um, I'm Tom Stevens from Fauna and Flora International, um, and I just wanted to pose two questions if I could. One was around um, carbon rights for, for local people and, and also government linking to the NDC. Could you just explain a little bit more around that and, and any structure you've kind of got in place and that you're looking forward to? And the second part of the question was around um, kind of where do you see the role in that process of um, NGOs like ourselves and, and many others? And how, how would how, what do you need from us? What can we do to support that process, either in a into the markets um, or at a project on the ground level, or, or somewhere in between? Anything around that would be good to know a bit more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I don't know if anything. In regards to the carbon rights, um, as you may know, Belize is a fairly young country. We just got our independence in 1981. Uh, so for us, we didn't have legislation on carbon because it wasn't the in thing at the time. So now we are going through that process in, um, in really consultation and trying to get our legislation in place to see who owns what and in the process also looking at the issue of uh, the sharing of, of, of the proceeds of benefit sharing with, with those communities. Um, you have some people in the private sector who own some lands and they will be looking at uh, some of those uh, carbon credits for, for their purposes. 
But we also have uh, very important uh, indigenous communities and other communities who live in these areas and who have been the actual stewards of, 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 of these forests. And so the legislation will have to be something that can also encompass uh, giving them that type of credit so that they can also benefit from it. And as the CEO had mentioned, also putting in place a system where uh, monies are left aside for continuation of the project and, 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 and doing the, the, the for further years and getting the benefit for the country. Thanks, thanks, Minister. So, so just to add to that, as, as Minister indicated, uh, that's that's sort of where we are now. Uh, as we sort of elaborate this framework, um, there's very limited precedence out there, as I understand, and, and we've been into some. The, the discussions and the debate between the, the, the lawyers and the technicians and you know how does Article 6 factor into some of this and the national legislation and, um, is it the same thing as a, as a mineral right and how do we define a carbon credit and, and all of these things I think these are some of the very interesting discussions um, that we are having as a country that I think in the end would be useful for a lot of countries who will be engaging in this process going forward um, we get to elaborate this earlier because we, we've had some results and, and of course we want to go to market uh, but I think the discussion that we're also having as a government is to ensure that again there is founded in some key principle whatever mo model that we apply whatever methodology we apply is founded within the principle that um, the, the, the broader mechanism um, the benefit sharing mechanism um, the, the sales mechanism it, it results in an approach that allows for again private sector is incentivized, um, NGOs is incentivized to continue to support communities, continue to support the conservation objectives because that has to be at the core. It's not just you know selling credits. It's this, it's this broader objective that we're, we're trying to achieve and maintain the, the quality and the health of our, of our stocks. Um, so the discussion that we're having is how do we outline a, a model that allows for this kind of thing to happen. Um, that's a process that, that, that has been on ongoing over the last couple months and, and I have for example Roger here with us who's been helping to do that and then Eduardo and, and some of the other teams that again we're currently outlining that and I'm, I'm hopeful that some some report can come out that, that again could be useful can be of some utility to other countries who will be in, engaging in that process. Any other questions comments? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mr. David Yambondo from Central African Republic. That, uh, my concern uh, was taken by uh, the last uh, response that uh, I want to know about the approach that the list used to implicate uh, indigenous people that uh, in the field of the uh, benefit sharing, that's why I am supposed to know about it and to share the experiences. Thank you. So I really just wanted to add um, a bit there because I think what we've done is applied a process that I think is, is unique not just for the Red Cross process, but um, what we've done is to, to strengthen the institutions that support the indigenous people engagement. Um, because what we've had, uh, what you normally have in institutions are the people who are more organized, they often more engaged. Um, and and they're, I think they're key, um, either indigenous or local, however you want to define it. Um, because of course some people will go down strict lines of, of defining, but um, I, I think the mechanism that we've established allows for engagement of local and indigenous people um, in a more integrated framework. So what do I mean? Um, this process outlined a, a Belize National Council of Indigenous People where no such thing existed. Um, we had, again, maybe a, a, a Mayan Council of Indigenous People, um, but there are other indigenous groups who normally did not engage um, in some of these processes and, and what this this project has done and what this process has done was to build out those institutions to broaden the, the consultation framework and that 
has been useful not just for this mechanism but for other mechanisms like developing a, an epic a free prior and informed consent protocol again that will be applied not just for this process but for the other national process that, that will be critical so I, I think those are some of the the, the outcomes that, that we need to champion and, and, and highlight Okay, I'm in Chilton Burton's in Dominica. Um, and I'm, I must say I'm, I'm very impressed by um, Bailey's presentation as a sister character from country. And um, we're really looking for you, um, you know, as inspiration to actually get our process completed. Um, we are still working with CFRN and we must um, thank CFRN and the group of experts for, for, for the support. Without that, um, I guess none of our countries would have been um, 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 at the level that we have. And um, we're just starting off, I mean, so it's very much, very much inspiration. We're hoping to be working with Belly. We're hoping that you can actually share some of that um, experience with us and work with us um, so that we can actually um, reach at some point to be able to come in front and present um, some of the results that, that maybe I'm um, not soon in the distant future will be able to do that uh, as probably as you've done. So again, just want to congratulate you um, on, on how well you've reached that spot. Questions? Um. No, I, I thought that was also important, and I, I wanted to ask Edgar because uh, that's what we want to do, and I think that's also one of the thrusts of CFRN, if I'm permitted to go that far, um, in, in terms of building capacity not just of a country but build the coalition because that's what, what it's about co co coalition and collaboration. No? Uh, so I wanted to ask uh, Edgar you know, to, to speak a little bit about some of the support that we've been providing to other countries um, in terms of in engaging in their process. Um, thanks to you. Yeah, um, well, we've been working through the coalition. With, with, um, we, we, we assisted Dominica as well when it comes to collection of activity data. And also we had assisted St. Lucia um, in, in terms of uh, collection of activity data. I'm sure the um, other countries within the coalition and we will be working along with them. We have uh, a better understanding of the process now um, and in terms of lessons learned and challenges. Um, we, we, we also uh, have that experience just as what Panama passed on to us and we learned from them. Um, I'm sure that, that, that we and our experience not only with the collection of activity data but as what the CEO mentioned, the minister mentioned in terms of its legislation, framework and all these different things that we're putting in place. Also when it comes to collection of uh, em emission factors and things, um, we're sure we're here um, to assist um, to keep the, the, the collision that is in terms of moving forward. So, yeah. Well, I see everybody looking down and away right now, so I guess no more questions. <laughs> um, you know, we want to hear from Summit. Summit, you've, you've done the permanent sample plots. Tell us about challenges, successes, lessons learned. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so like I mentioned, one of the key accomplishments on the Red Plus project was really to expand our forest and non-forest monitoring network. Um, we've added over, I'd say over 30, 30 plots, which include, like I, I mentioned prior, on the cropland grasslands as well as broadleaf pine forest and mangrove forest as well so we've really had a we really have a robust data set that really encompasses the entire country again across the three climatic zones dry moist and wet and like the ceo edgar the minister have been saying i think um we're in a position to assist our sister countries our mem member other members of the coalition and we're definitely open to that we all have a collective collective goal really to combat and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Uh, some of the challenges early on, I would say, was really the getting everybody you know, to in, in one room and really moving forward to this. But fortunately, that happened really quickly. Everybody was on board, and we saw the importance of this. And in terms of capacity building, it was it's more than just the members under the project. It's really across ministries, across departments. And so I think we now have a, a better understanding. We, we know where we need to be. And we're all ready to continue contributing to that work. And like we've committed in our frill, our recently submitted frill, uh, it's really we, we want to continue improving, continue expanding this network. 
and I'm sure we'll get there and continue that work. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bethencourt. Um, if, if there are no other questions, uh, I think we're nearing straight down to the end. I just want to conclude by saying that Red Cross is absolutely important for us, you know, as a country with very low emissions in terms of the worldwide averages, with, uh, zero point something something with below one percent, zero point something percent. You know, um, adaptation is important to us. Um, low carbon development is important to us, and sustainable development is important to us. So even though we are participating in Red Dots, it is our hope that whatever we gain through this mechanism can be used to invest in our country and our people for our future development and so that we can be resilient to this uh, whole phenomenon called climate change. So I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks to everyone on the panel for the presentations, for the remarks, for the answers that were given. Thanks to everyone in the audience for the questions uh, and the remarks made and the, and the comments. We really appreciate it. We appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll end off right now. And I want to wish you a good afternoon and uh, see you at our next event. So thank you very much.